Our sermon text for today is the Gospel lesson for the second Sunday after Epiphany. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Today's Gospel is so full of comfort for Christians, it is difficult to know where to begin. In it, our Lord blesses the state of matrimony by his presence and by special gifts. In it, he also blesses the use of earthly pleasures, such as the use of wine, so that we may enjoy the gifts of the earth with a free conscience. He also shows the effectiveness of faithful prayer, especially when made on behalf of others. For Mary prayed on behalf of the marriage couple and received a most amazing reply, even if she herself did not witness it. He also foreshadows and sanctifies the ordinary work of the church in the following ways. Mary told the servants to do whatever Jesus tells them. This, in summary, is the entire work of the church. For everything that we do as the church of Christ is only obedience to whatever he has commanded us. If only the Church of the Pope would heed the words of the Virgin Mary when she tells them, Ignore me, but whatever the Christ says to you, do it. Likewise, the office of the ministry is sanctified when the Lord calls on the servants to carry out his will, especially through the distribution of the miraculous wine. For in the church, the Christ distributes his life-giving blood in, with, and under ordinary wine through his servants, the pastors. And we may be certain that this sacrament is truly the gift of the Lord, even though it is given to us by the hands of sinful men. Finally, through the example of water turned to wine, our Lord teaches us to be comforted in every affliction, because he stands ready to turn the worst of our sufferings into the greatest of pleasures. In fact, the greater the suffering, the grander and more spectacular the grace which he bestows on his children. All of these comforting and faithful truths are expressed in today's gospel text. And there is not time to expound on them all. But we would be missing the mark if we said that this passage was about marriage or prayer or the church. Rather, this passage is about the Lord Jesus Christ. Certainly, Marriage, prayer, and the church are all confessed and taught, but only as they are understood in the Lord Jesus Christ. The wedding at Cana reveals the Christ in a new light. Just as the text itself says, the beginning of signs... Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. Okay. 
In the example of Cana, we see how man, without the Christ, falls short. The bridegroom has failed to supply sufficient wine. Mary can do nothing to fix the matter. Even the master of the feast does not know what is going on. Everyone in charge of the wedding feast has failed. But the Lord Jesus Christ commands the servants, performs a miracle, and saves the couple from embarrassment, and reveals himself to be the true bridegroom of the church, the true benefactor of all men, and the true Lord of the heavenly feast. The point of this text is that the Christ has become our Lord. Now, a Lord is different than a slave owner. In the language of Scripture and the confessions, the title Lord is fitting only for one who loves and provides for those in his care. It is written in 1 Peter how Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. <clears throat> Thus, confessing the Christ to be our Lord is the same as confessing him to be the bridegroom of the church. The church submits to him as an obedient wife, and he supplies her every need as a diligent lord and husband. Furthermore, in the large catechism, Dr. Luther explains the title Lord in the following way. I believe that Jesus Christ, true Son of God, has become my Lord. But what is it to become a Lord? It is that he has redeemed me from sin, from the devil, from death, and all evil. For before I had no Lord or King, but was captive under the power of the devil, condemned to death bound in sin and blindness. Let it then be considered the sum of this article that the little word Lord signifies simply as much as Redeemer. That is, he who has brought us from Satan to God, from death to life, from sin to righteousness and who preserves us in the same. Thus far the large catechism. Here again, we see that the word Lord includes goodness and mercy. For when we were captives to sin, we belonged to the devil. Yet the devil was not our Lord in this sense. For he had no desire for our good. Rather, he was a slave master who only wanted our eternal damnation. But now, through baptism, we have a Lord. One who supplies our needs and defends us from the devil as every husband is commanded to do for his wife. And we, in turn, are commanded to honor and submit to him, our Lord and Savior, as every wife is commanded to do for her husband. And if husband and wife do their own part well, it allows the other to do theirs. 
If the husband does not command, the wife has nothing to submit to. And if the wife does not submit, the husband will not be able to protect her. But if the wife submits to her husband, it allows him to command her what is good. And if the husband loves his wife, he will only command her what provides for her needs and protects her from evil. Now we are speaking of the Christ and his wife, the church. For although human marriage should follow his example, it has been corrupted by sin and cannot be as it should. This is not to say that marriage has become evil. On the contrary, our Lord is pleased to honor marriage with both his divine presence and with unique and special gifts. But we do not look for the perfect marriage here on earth. The perfect marriage only exists between the Lord Jesus Christ and his church. He is the only husband whose love is without selfishness. He is the only husband who can truly provide all good things for his wife, including the gifts of salvation and the forgiveness of sins. We, then, who make up his church, honor and submit to him in all he commands us, because we know and trust that everything he commands is for our good. Chiefly, he has commanded us to make use of the means of grace, because these are the gifts which communicate to us eternal life and the forgiveness of sins. If we were to refuse these gifts, we would not only be unfaithful to our Lord, but would be depriving ourselves of the very love and protection which it is his lordly duty to give. Therefore, we must be diligent in the word and the sacraments. First, because it is our duty as the members of the church. But how much more? Because we know these are our chief goods from him. Now, the goodness of our Lord goes far beyond merely the necessities. He not only gives us the chief gifts of salvation, but also all temporary goods. As it is written in Romans chapter 8, He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things. Here is the example of the water turned to wine. When our Lord attended the wedding at Cana, he not only offered the couple salvation through himself, he also blessed them with an abundance of the finest wine for their enjoyment. For he who shed his blood for his bride will not refuse her even temporary enjoyments. Therefore, the earth and everything in it belongs to the children of God. 
through the Lord Jesus Christ. For he is our Lord, and he has given all creation for our enjoyment. Each and every earthly pleasure is a sign of his great love and of the chief gift of his own blood by which we are saved and forgiven. It is then our duty as members of his bride, the church, to submit to his commands and to receive all these gifts with thanksgiving. Amen. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.